Everybody, welcome to uh, the last NFTX governance call of this year. Uh, happens every first Wednesday of the month, and it's December, so it's the yeah last of the year. Uh, this one uh, is kind of light uh, because like we're uh, focusing on product a lot and trying to tie up a lot of uh, things on both protocol on single sided staking and on the uh, the actual app. Uh, so we got the whole app team here. Uh, nobody from protocol as far as I know and can see. Uh, so we'll just start off with running through the week, uh, the weekly roundup, which had a like a small break for a while. Uh, and then we'll open the floor up for any questions uh, and uh, move from there. And maybe Alex joins in the in the course of the call. So, uh, Jerry, want to run through the weekly? Yeah, cool. Thanks, Chop. Uh, if anyone has any questions too, as we go through, if you just drop them into the into the chat as well, yeah. or, or click put your hand up, and we can go back and touch on that as well. So, yeah, like Chop said, there's been a, a lull in the weekly updates. We turned them into a fortnightly update, and then it turned into kind of like a month. Uh, went by because we we're uh, busy building and it sort of fell to the the bottom of the list but uh, it's going to come back now uh, we'll keep it uh, frequent or we'll try and move back into the cadence of every two weeks to make sure that we're pushing things out just to let everyone know that things are still being built um, even though you might not see things uh, through the front end as well um, so with the with the update we're uh, currently looking at uh, just under uh, 52 million of uh, TVL locked. Uh, and in the past 30 days, uh, NFTX has generated 370K in fees to all our liquidity providers. And I'll touch a bit on sort of the past um, uh, fee generations as well in a little bit. Um, on the 31st of October, we hit a small milestone as well. Um, for since the release of V2, we crossed over the 1,000 ETH mark for the amount of fees generated and distributed to all the NFTX liquidity providers as well. So well done to anyone who's been picking up all those fees. Uh, we also released uh, swaps since uh, the last update that came out. So that's now live and you can go along to uh, nftx.io slash swaps uh, or click on swaps in the menu. Uh, and you can swap any of your uh, NFTs that are in your wallet with any of the ones inside of the current vaults. So as long as you've got uh, a matching NFT in your collection with one of the vaults, you can now swap them um, across just using a, a single transaction. Um, but lots of stuff happens uh, in the background. Um, and as part of that swap, what we also did is uh, we introduced uh, two new sets of fees as well. So as well as having redeem fees, random redeem fees, and minting fees. We also added in a swap fee, so a target swap fee, and a random swap fee. Uh, random swaps aren't available through the UI at the moment, so even though you set the fee, there's no way of uh, accessing it, um, but the swap fee's in there. And we also, uh, at that point, made an update to the default fees that are applied to vaults when you, you create them. Um, so they now sit at, uh, for, for redeems, mints, and swaps, they sit at a default 10%. And for the random redeems and the random swaps, they sit at a default of 5%. Uh, you can always change the fees uh, when you're creating the vaults. And we had a couple of questions that came up uh, once those uh, fees had been changed as for people that had uh, existing vaults uh, or even in the past, when people wanted to update the fees on vaults they had created, they realized that they didn't have access. So once you have published a vault, you can no longer make changes to it to make sure that people that jump in and start using it then don't get rugged by you reducing the fees for your own good or increasing them. Um, so what you can do if you ever do need to change fees is that we ask people, whoever has, if someone has a 50% uh, hold of the liquidity pool, then they can send a signed message through to us uh, denoting what the uh, vault ID is and what the new fee structure needs to be. And then we'll go through and make that change, but it needs to be more than 50%. Uh, if they don't own more than 50% of it, then we ask that they run a sort of a, a stage, a snapshot vote to allow people either with um, SLP or 
those that hold the tokens to vote. And again, we're looking for more than 50% to make it make a change. Just so that we don't have someone that has 1% uh, um, one of the liquidity come in and just say, I want to change the fees. Um, and it impacts people that have more, more say in that. So that's the process if anyone ever needs to, to make a change. Uh, there was also a Twitter post recently around uh, fee accumulation through uh, NFTs, um, through NFT tools like NFTX, uh, like Fractional and like NFT20 as well. Um, and they showed the uh, the graph over the last sort of uh, couple of months and uh, NFTX just has done incredibly well. So in July, you looked, uh, we had 850,000 uh, dollars worth of fees generated uh, for liquidity providers in August. It was 2.1 million. In September, it was 745,000, and in October, it was 803,000. So really good, really good um, fee generation for people as well. Uh, this month has been a bit lower, but then everything's been a bit bearish around NFTs as well. Uh, the other thing that's coming up, uh, and that the team have been busy working on uh, the last couple of weeks, is single-sided staking. Um, which will allow us or people to then uh, to put in inventory into our vaults rather than having to put both inventory and ETH as well. Um, Chop or someone, does anyone want to yeah, go into yeah. a bit of detail about the, the single sided? Uh, yeah, I can uh, do it on a, like a, a high level. And if anyone has questions, just uh, just like uh, raise your hand and speak up, I guess. Um, so basically the ID comes from a discussion we had a few months ago where uh, at a certain level is just not as viable as it's uh, when a, like a vault starts to keep adding NFTs paired with liquidity, like good example, punks. Um, a lot of people have punks, uh, but they're worth like 350K at the moment or 400. Uh, so it's a bit of a hard ask to ask people to LP pairing that NFT with 400k uh, worth of ETH to uh, be able to generate any like type of protocol revenue. Uh, so the like the vaults started to not really grow uh, as it used to, and it sort of like yeah became inactive in terms of LPing. So we uh, said to ourselves, like, how can we still improve the growth of uh, like activity? Because activity in a vault is what generates the fees, which uh, like ups the APY per vault, uh, while not requiring people to put up that amount of money, uh, which ended up being single-sided uh, staking. So single-sided staking is nothing like more than just staking NFTs instead of NFTs plus ETH or uh, any other pair that you want to. Um, with the benefit for NFTX, uh, the protocol and all its users, uh, being that there's more inventory in a vault, so there's more choice for shoppers to pick and choose uh, NFTs from. So there's a higher chance that someone actually buys or redeems a NFT from a vault, which, gener which generates fees. Um, obviously, it, it it's not equal value as people putting up liquidity. So the fee split, we're starting off with 80-20 on all vaults. And then we just have to like measure how it actually turns out working and what happens on the inventory side of things, if it grows as expected or not, or and stuff like that. So yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, I think it's being implemented on the front that's similar to how normal staking works at the moment, right, uh, Jeffrey? Yeah, that's right. It's, um, it's a bit more complex now because you could have single-sided and double-sided staking, um, mm -hmm. and there's different APYs for both of them. So, yeah, the team has done a really good job, and that's in uh, sort of rinkaby style testing at the moment. Yeah. Um, but, there's, yeah, we've got some uh, some screenshots on the on the weekly if anyone wants to have a peek. Yeah, and, and one one thing to note is, uh, like, if you're not that familiar with uh, yield farming, uh, the pools that are going to uh, give out the rewards, uh, the, like the claimable yields for people putting in uh, liquidity tokens or inventory, uh, they're going to be isolated from each other. So uh, that means that at the start, when this all rolls out, 
the first people that uh, start to stake their inventory positions will capture all of the like 20% of the fees by themselves. So as long as nobody else joins that staking position, they accrue all the all of the 20%. Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be huge. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Um, the okay. other thing uh, that's happened recently is we've been uh, growing the team, so we've uh, extended uh, core positions by one. Uh, and brought on uh, Jackie Boy, uh, who's helping out Quag with the back end, uh, sorry, with the front end stuff, uh, and looking primarily around infrastructure. Um, and then we also brought Toes and Ato into to the crew roles as well. Um, they've been helping the DAO behind the scenes with lots of support and documentation, business development. Um, and that's thanks to their input recently uh, over the last couple of months through the governance calls and just on Discord as well. So huge welcome to all three of those as well. Um, just a, just a, one of the questions that came in in terms of, uh, oh yeah, thanks, thanks, Craig. Someone asked whether or not you can put ETH in instead as a single sided instead of the NFT for single sided, but it is just the tokens. So it's the NFTs only on that side. Um, we're also, uh, we had a vote over the last couple of weeks around uh, taking some of our sushi from the uh, treasury and buying uh, GRT. Uh, and GRT is the token for the graph protocol. Uh, the graph is what we use to make uh, our front end work. Basically, we do lots of calls there to to find out what um, what vaults we have, what's in the vaults, um, and also around your stakes positions and kind of it powers everything that you see uh, to become more decentralized and uh, to contribute back to the decentralized infrastructure. We're taking uh, 100,000 GRT tokens and staking that on their platform, and we're going to be running our own graph nodes, um, which index uh, the Ethereum node and and build out these um, these complex queries for us as well. Um, so that's something that we're we're going through and, and doing at the moment. Um, not only are we contributing back to the uh, the idea of the decentralization uh, as well, but we can also we will also be earning uh, rewards through the contributions as well. So, as people use either our NFTX subgraph to build on more things um, for NFTX, uh, we'll get a portion of the fees that are uh, uh, contributed to making those requests. Um, we're also going to be indexing the Sushi graph as well as the ERC721 and the 1155 graphs as well. So we're hoping that that will also turn into a re revenue generation um, for the DAO. Um, and one last bit is just on the, the filters, just to let anyone know that um, has existing collections uh, on NFTX. We integrated filters uh, a couple of months ago, um, and it's been really helpful for people to be able to find uh, really specific NFTs in larger collections, or even pulling out um, some rarer types uh, NFTs that you would have lost in a larger collection instead of scrolling through them all. Um, one thing we found though is that we're reliant on the uh, metadata which is stored uh, by OpenSea, and sometimes that metadata isn't as uh, fully uh, fully functional, uh, well, or fully it doesn't have as much metadata as we sometimes need it to. Uh, so things like the Mana Vault, which people were using um, Mana as cards, uh, and you needed to to um, to buy up collections, but it was hard to scroll through the hundreds that were in there. Um, and what Nick was able to find is that we could get some additional metadata which the team had and run a separate function when we're importing them um, into our search filters. Uh, which would then add the additional metadata afterwards. And we kind of called it um, uh, snowflake uh, filter options. So now that we have that, we've been able to do things like uh, include just the attribute counts for punks. Um, we're also going to go through and working on uh, making the the punks metadata a little bit <clears throat> a little bit better. Like everything is an accessory with a punk, but we're going to itemize it so that you can have just, uh, specifics about hairstyles or what they're smoking or whether they have facial hair or the type of facial hair or the type of hat that they're wearing as well. Um, yeah, the things that... Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> so one of the other things that uh, we built onto it is for one of the other vaults called Art Site, which I have that allow you to go to the site and uh, if you own the membership, free mint of one of the items on the site or one of the, the collections, art box, imagine the art box and then uh, pulling down uh, a free art box if you own the membership. Uh, but once you pull it down, that you're no longer entitled to uh, to go and mint as items. So people have been sort of going through, pulling out the memberships, going minting it, and then putting them back in, which is fine. Um, but what we now do with the snowflake filter option is that uh, on the fly, when someone puts that item into the vault, we do a Web3 call to look up to see what items it hasn't minted yet, and then adds that to the metadata as well. So it just makes it easier for us to be able to uh, find the the right NFT for them. So if anyone has a, a collection that they're looking at using or knows about additional metadata that could make finding the right NFT for their collection um, a bit easier, um, let us know and we can help you build these snowflakes in um, into the filtering mechanism as well. Uh, now has uh, has has uh, turned out. That's that's all I've got at the moment. Um, Alex, is there anything that you wanted to? I know you've missed a lot, so you might not yeah, know I'm, what we've I'm covered. Which so basically sorry. we've gone through the, That's all right. We've gone through the weekly and um, and uh, Chop did an explanation of single sided staking as well. So that sort of stuff is covered. Cool. Uh, yeah. So, sorry, everyone. I thought the meeting was at the top of the hour. I didn't realize we had we had changed the time. Uh, I was on Twitter, but um, <laughs> yeah. No, the last month has been. Uh, pretty interesting we did the london meetup which was uh fun to get like most of the team at least uh to meet up in person for the first time um we've got a couple like secret projects kind of under wraps that we're working on that we're not i'm not really supposed to discuss but um should be some cool updates in the next month or two uh as far as um other stuff that I can talk about, uh, two things that have really been on my mind lately. Um, one is, you know, getting um, feature parity with OpenSea. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how there's a real opportunity at the moment for a fully decentralized uh, NFT marketplace, you know, uh, that's entirely on chain. And um, we think that NFTX is really well positioned for this. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. Uh, and I think a lot of teams are going to be rolling out their plans for creating their own decentralized marketplace um, without perhaps necessarily realizing how much work really is required um, on the infrastructure side. Unlike making um, you know, a front end for like a token swap protocol, um, the front end for a decentralized marketplace is pretty advanced. There's a lot of metadata caching, uh, media caching, uh, and we have a lot of these pieces already built uh, thanks to Quag and the rest of the product team. So yeah, we think we're really well positioned to kind of build feature parity with OpenSea and perhaps start competing more directly with them in the new year. The other thing that's really been on my mind uh, is just, you know, ongoing liquidity difficulties. Um, right now, a lot of the vaults are still uh, pretty illiquid and there's still quite a bit of slippage. So we're looking into like concentrated liquidity solutions. I also think that there's an opportunity to do use uh, something other than AMMs for liquidity. So I've been putting together some code that basically will allow people to set their own rates, their own sell curves on NFTs. Um, as an example, like I have a bunch of uh, UWU crew NFTs, like a couple hundred now. And um, I'm really looking forward to single side staking to be able to stake, you know, like 200 UWU crew NFTs. And then that way I earn part of the rewards. However, I would also love to be able to kind of take profits on those UWU crew NFTs um, over time without actually having to pair it with ETH in an AMM. So yeah, I've been working on some code that allows 
would allow like whales basically or, or anyone that's single side staking to also set their own take profits curve. Um, and they could kind of set their own parameters for this, whether they want it to be like a linear rate or an exponential rate. Um, and basically it would, yeah, it would allow them to supply buy side liquidity. Um, so it would improve the liquidity for people that are coming to the site, just looking to buy. And um, it's easier for the liquidity provider because they don't actually have to provide ETH with that. Uh, so yeah, that's one thing I'm looking forward to as well. And I'm hoping that we can get out there. Uh, and yeah, sorry, <laughs> sorry again. <laughs> missing uh, most of the call i was busy tweeting that that definitely won't happen again um, i i had the opposite side i was here 30 minutes too early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i think the time change has also kind of thrown some of us off yeah um, yeah I <laughs> dear raj like tweeted at me sir and i'm like what is this guy what is this guy tweeting sir at me for um, <laughs> Uh, anyways, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad I made it at the end. Um, but yeah, definitely some cool stuff over the coming weeks. Um, we're all working really hard to, you know, push out more features uh, since the last month was a, a bit slow in regards to shipping. But um, really great, you know, getting together with the team and actually meeting a lot of the guys in person. It, it all feels a lot more real. And uh, yeah, hoping that the whole team can make it out to the next one. Uh, should I pass it off to Chop, Javery, or like open it up to anyone else that wants to talk? Uh, yeah, I think it's mostly opening up. Uh, our agenda is probably done. Uh, I think, did did we mention the formal audit uh, anywhere yet? Oh, like Trail of Bits? No, it's yeah. worth, worth talking about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, over the last... Or months or something uh, like not not a lot to be uh, to be done, but we've uh, searched for very high profile auditors uh, to do a another rundown on like the uh, V two protocol, uh, as that's getting pretty close to feature completeness. Uh, uh, yeah, we thought it, it's just good for like extra security and having extra eyes on it. So we reached out to a lot of uh, auditors. Including Trail of Bits, uh, and we're choosing to run with Trail of Bits in early Q2 of next year. Uh, so everything is already planned. Uh, in April, they'll be looking at uh, at our codes, uh, like similarly similarly to how we did Code Arena, but then from an actual audit uh, company uh, instead of like this contest ID, which is also uh, very uh, working very well, but. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's coming up. Uh, we'll probably lock uh, or freeze the code uh, a bit before that, right? Uh, to like uh, not have any changes uh, while they're auditing. Uh, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's amazing how long it takes to to book an audit these days. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the fun, booking it is. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is that it the, like all their uh, all the other options uh, had their entire 2022 booked, uh, so it would take more than a year. Wow! So yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, test and production. But no, it is good to get a second check um, yeah. as soon as we can, and hopefully by then our code will be changing less uh, yeah. on a less regular basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, uh, anyone, um, anyone got like questions or comments or um, thoughts? Feel free to. I don't know. I guess, I guess you raise your hand or you can just start talking. Yeah, yeah just know that you're muted most likely. So you have to click the unmute button. Hey, good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yay. Hey. 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 Um, I just had a question about how we're thinking about onboarding like new projects, other projects into like making NFTX vaults like a core part of uh, their experience. Yeah, it's um, yeah. it's a good, good question. Um, I, I'll say right off the bat that. 
it's uh it's really interesting to see how like a lot of new projects do somehow find out about us and it seems like the projects which kind of dive into nftx from their inception are the ones that get the most out of it uh, but yeah there's definitely some opportunity for us to still kind of uh, promote and go into growth more mode more uh, javery does a pretty good job do you have any thoughts on that javery yeah, at the moment it's because there's so many projects launching. Uh, yeah. It's it's difficult to sort of get in with every single one. Like it would be many people's full time job uh, to to reach out yeah. to them all. Um, what we tend to see is that when people uh, like larger ones that that do cross our paths, uh, will dive into their Discord. Um, what I tend to do is dive in, search for the term NFTX, uh, and see if anyone's mentioned it. And then ten, what tends to be is someone has already done when NFTX pull. Um, and then I'll just reach out and say, look, if uh, if anyone needs a hand setting it up, I'm, I'm here and I'll join and then I'll keep an eye out for it. Um, we make ourselves available. Well, I make myself available for uh, teams that do approach us to run Twitter spaces or Discord chats as well um, to go through some tokenomic stuff, which um, the Penelope's has set up to sort of give them best case like uh, best practices as well so that they don't hurt their hurt their um liquidity providers or or token holders as well to try and keep those people um as first class citizens as well as people that hold the nft themselves um, mm -hmm. but yeah any any other suggestions on on how to uh, one of the other things that we're doing at the moment um which is doing a bit with uh alex but i'm gonna take it on first of all uh is just to do a bit more around some marketing documentation and splitting it into three mm -hmm. areas of shoppers, stakers, and NFT projects. And then, so if you're a shopper, you're buying or selling. And so it's all about like, what what is NFTX and how can we help you buy and sell your NFTs? If you're staking, it's all about like, what is it? What are the risks? How do you go about it? How do you claim? How do we pay things out? Uh, and then for NFT projects, it'll be more about how does NFTX benefit projects and communities, how the liquidity pools help, uh, how they can earn stake and uh, earn yields on staking, um, best practices for setting up liquidity pools to make sure they're successful, um, things like that. But yeah, open to suggestions, definitely. And contributions. Yeah, is Jav doing a, a really good job um, spearheading like uh, basically new documentation for non-developers, which is mm. something we definitely need, like more marketing materials. And we think, you know, after that's uh, all polished up, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna help, um, you know, finish that up as well. Then the next step is like hiring like infographic illustrators um, mm -hmm. and like yeah. short video designers that can kind of take these marketing materials and put them into like a concise 60 second, 90 second video. Uh, you know, we've still been building so much and changing that we haven't really gone into this full marketing growth phase. I think Chop is also yeah. looking to onboard. Yeah, yeah onboard yeah. a friend. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, so so I'm uh, simultaneously working on uh, onboarding uh, friends that I work with a lot uh, who uh, uh, like specialize in BD, uh, so business development, uh, to also approach it from that side uh, to complement basically what Alex and Javery just explained. So uh, like content marketing plus BD. Mm -hmm. And um, the, la sorry, Ado, the last thing I'll mention there quickly is just like how I was saying about having this one-sided liquidity so that whales can kind of create these sell orders. I do think that that could be a great first step to us um, allowing like kind of like a launch pad for projects to, you know, do their entire distribution through a vault. So it's like, let's say, you know, you've just made like a 10,000 avatar project or something, um, then you can just set your own curve or like even like a flat curve or something um, on how you want to sell those NFTs. And then, you know, right from day one, um, the vault is already bootstrapped and people are using the vault to, you know, redeem their NFT initially. Um, so I, yeah, that has a lot of, uh, potential as well, but go ahead. I think you were going to say yeah, something. That's, that's interesting. Like bonding curve as a service, uh, would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, cause I'm, 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 I'm just thinking like, you know, like product and building it's, it's never going to end. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we're always trying to catch up with, well, not, not catch up, but just 
-hmm. like there's always new stuff to build um but at the same time like we have to look at what's working with existing vaults right so i so i, so I look at this um this this dune dashboard that you guys created um basically every day and, and just looking at like which which are the projects that have that are basically actively using it every single day right like funks um like coom coom g coom kings mana mm -hmm. um some of these like later later ones um like basically like can we talk to them and like figure out like what what was it that made them how, like be able to use nft and nftx vaults so successful um yeah, absolutely I, my guess is that they are getting a lot of success because they have just um, taken like an NFTX first approach uh, from the community and their own de dev teams. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, these vaults that have like hundreds of NFTs in them and are highly liquid, it just works so well. Whereas once, you know, the, the vault starts falling under 100 NFTs, starts getting weak liquidity, uh, you kind of enter this death spiral situation. Uh, so yeah, like a few months ago, I was all about us focusing on like punks, board apes. And like you said, like now, if you look at the Dune dashboard, um, it's these, these newer projects with these smaller market caps that are really taking advantage of us. So I, I do think that it's good for us to kind of pivot to, you know, providing the most value to the people that are taking the most um, advantage of our platform. Yeah, so it's like working with uh, the NFT devs like even before they do their drop or, or like pretty soon mm -hmm. after to see the vaults pretty early um, and then like kind of work with the community or just let their community know that way. Um, yeah. And I, I, I do think that it's also partially um, just a time thing. Like I, I try to shield to people. It's like, you know, why, why have royalties when you could just have like a community yeah. treasury and then put that into a vault and then actually earn um, income from it. And I do think more and more communities and teams are kind of coming around to this idea that there's all this DeFi black magic that's actually available. Um, and you can do really cool stuff with like a community treasury. Um, and like, just looking at like HD punks, you know, how they're doing this, like using NFTX to burn the vault tokens as opposed to burning the NFTs themselves. Um, thus, you know, pushing up the price, but, you know, not actually losing access to those NFTs forever. So, yeah, I, I do think it's just, uh, I'm hoping it's just a matter of time as more NFT projects um, look for ways to kind of compete on tokenomics. Mm -hmm. But the marketing materials, I think, will be huge. Um, then we can just start, you know, kind of dropping those into these projects laps and hopefully, yeah, getting them early <laughs> so that they can see the big vault. Yeah, like there's every NFT drop is kind of unique. There's no standard platform. So I, I guess mm -hmm. it is kind of tough to like work with like an NFT platform because there, there really isn't a standard one. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, we keep, there's a lot that you say they're going to be coming out soon um like nameless uh manifold uh the universe but um yeah so far it doesn't seem like anyone's really kind of executed on this launch pad mm -hmm. use case um and even if we can't execute on like the actual deploying um side itself if we could execute on the distribution part like just helping teams you know yeah set their own curves um, so they don't have to do all this advanced logic themselves. It's a win-win because then the team, yeah, that makes less work for them. And then it's a win for us because the vault is seated and bootstrapped from day one. Yep. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah and Dismal Jellyfish is just posting in um, the chat here about how the, the biggest um, – great for the HG punks at the moment is the gas costs. And yeah, a hundred percent, you know, everything over the last 12 months has just been changing so fast. And L2 seems like it's pretty inevitable for NFTs. Um, and a lot, I think a lot of people are just kind of waiting for like the, the L2 boom, which is hopefully coming sooner rather than later. Um, and, and we're definitely looking at deploying on as many L2s as possible. It was just yesterday that Quag shared like a, this project layer zero, which looked super promising. Um, but yeah, we want to be on as many L2s as possible. And I think a lot of projects are going to be looking to actually deploy the NFTs on the layer two, as mm -hmm. opposed to layer one, um, just to avoid the gas costs. 
Um, and yeah, last thing I'll, I'll mention on that is that uh, I do think we'll have an advantage over projects like OpenSea. Um, OpenSea, you know, they, they're kind of like part web two and part web three. And that's what allows them to do cool stuff um, like gasless um, sell orders. So, you know, you can offer your item for sale without actually having to pay gas. But I think as there's more and more L2s getting spun up that use uh, the EVM, it's going to be more work for these Web2, Web3 hybrid projects to deploy on these other chains. Whereas projects like, like ourselves that are basically purely Web3 and all on chain, it's going to be a lot more simple for us to just kind of take our solidity and, you know, deploy on Polygon, deploy on Palm, et cetera. Um, however, it, it does also take time because there's there's a lot of pieces to the ecosystem that are required, like we've realized with Palm, um, little things like block explorers that, you know, until the ecosystem has uh, all these pieces, it's hard to take advantage of. Yeah. Um, may I ask something in regards to the current topic? Uh, do mm -hmm. you stop me if it's meant more for the Discord than the government's call, the governance call? But the main question is, would it be beneficial to try to, in a sense, speed run emerging EVM-based chains or L2s purely to make uh, NFTX as diverse as possible while also being the first marketplace, thus being the first point of adoption for new networks. Definitely. Um, definitely, we want we want to be as fast as possible. Um, yeah, is, is Nick on this call actually, or is, no? Nick didn't oh, make it. No. Or... The make reason it. the reason there's some hesitation when I ask this is because some people might potentially view expanding to change as fast as possible as diluting NFTX. Please excuse the doggo. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, on the other hand, though, I've recently seen an expansion in Solana with Neon VM, which promises to be able to execute uh, EVM code on the Solana network. Any thoughts to that? Yeah, um, I'm definitely open to us launching on Solana um, along with other chains like Avalanche and uh, Polygon and you know all the rest. Um, I know JB on our team is pretty keen on Solana. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, I, I was doing a talk with uh, Dismal Jellyfish the other day and I was talking about how it's taken us quite a while with Palm. Like we were hoping to make, you know, deploy in like one month um, and basically there are these hiccups that aren't really our own fault. Um, just like, for example, the block explorer on Palm, it doesn't support proxy contracts. Um, and a lot of our contracts use proxies. So we're kind of waiting for them to hopefully get ether scanned on Palm or to add proxies to the block explorer. And there's, there's just little pieces like this that you don't really realize um, how important they are to, you know, properly executing um, contracts until you actually try and deploy. And yeah, I think it's just a matter of time. And then hopefully we will just be able to go around and, you know, deploy, 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 deploy. Um, and the NFTX front end, you can just kind of select which chain you want to be on. Uh, and we can basically use the same code base all around. Uh, my expectation is that most people will probably converge on a couple uh, side chains. Um, as opposed to, you know, dispersing across all of them. So it is good, though, for us to hit as many as we can, because you never know which one's going to be the next big thing, um, and you want to be ready when the crowd comes. It's too bad Nick's not here, because uh, Nick is really the man kind of heading up a lot of that stuff, um, and I, I think he's pretty eager to get on other chains as well. Mm -hmm. Uh Another thing that we've been talking about a bit is uh, the ability to basically uh, mint on layer one on Ethereum. So like you would put, uh, let's say you're doing it with the CryptoPunk, you put a CryptoPunk into the vault on layer one, and then you'd get your punk token on a different L2. Uh, and we think that there's quite a bit of potential for that. 
uh, like our, you know, the punk token, it really hasn't taken off as much as we'd like yet. Uh, but we think it's still early and there are going to be a lot of people that want to get exposure to uh, collections like punk and board apes without actually having to buy a full token. And that this having something like that, where, you know, it's basically using Ethereum as a settlement layer uh, for these funds to kind of get minted and redeemed, but then the actual trading of the funds to happen in cheaper environments. Um, there's a lot of potential there. And I know Nick's pretty keen on uh, getting that working in the next couple months, hopefully. And uh, Dismal Jellyfish is just um, commenting here about how um, thinks there's a lot of potential for gaming and the staking. Um, one thing, it's funny because, you know, I, I went over this in our talk with, that I did with Dismal the other day. But um, so, like, this goes back to how there is, like, a bit of a, a challenge right now with a lot of these vaults. Like, Subducks, you know, you can claim vault tokens. Um, crypto Kongs, you can claim banana and basically people that are using vaults aren't able to take advantage of these rewards. Um, and we do think, you know, in the future, like with gaming NFTs, there's going to be even more opportunities. It's like, if you have, you know, a hundred Zergs in some vault and you want to Zerg rush somebody or, you know, whatever, um, like, it's like, how do you take advantage of those assets in a productive way while still having them exist? you know, primarily in the vault. Uh, so that's something we're looking into. It, it's not an easy problem to solve. Um, one route is to make vaults kind of more like DAOs in the sense that the vault token holders will be able to govern what's possible. Um, another thing we're looking into is like on the front end right now, you know, we have like buy, sell, swap. We're thinking of adding another one there. So it's like buy, sell, swap, zap. Um, and that way it would allow people to execute arbitrary code modules um, from the perspective of the vault itself, um, as long as those modules are approved, um, which would let people do, you know, pay to basically take advantage of some asset for some short time from the vault, um, zap it out, you know, do their product productive action, zap it back in, pay a fee. Um, and yeah, we think, oh, go ahead, Javery. I was going to say that this also comes back to Ado's point earlier, and what you mentioned as well is that it, as more and more uh, as more NFT projects are releasing and realize that liquidity pools is part of a long sustainable community, they will mm -hmm. get in touch. Um, we've had a project reach out who have gone through like loads of iterations um, with us to say like, okay, so if we stake this, what happens with the SLP, and then what do they get? And they've worked out a way that they can um, generate this additional currency like bananas, um, but do it for people that actually hold the SLP token or hold the X token for the SLP that is staked on NFTX and still reward them, uh, mm -hmm. those that are holding it. So they're working it into the mechanics of the NFT project itself. So if people continue to move in that way, these sort of things don't become issues anymore because they're thought of upfront. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really great when teams actually take the initiative themselves and find ways to integrate with the vault token holders. Um, and I do think that the teams that, you know, are taking advantage of vaults from like their own community treasury perspective are the most likely to be the ones um, to look at it from that perspective. So yeah, again, it goes back to getting them early <laughs> so that they have all the incentive to actually make it work. Is there anything that could be shared on what they've done? Because that sounds exactly like what we're trying to do on the HD Punk side by using the HD Punk token to potentially power cooperative gameplay for other punks that have bought into other projects that might not be able to afford an entire set themselves but if we pair the items together we've got a better mm -hmm. chance of uh capturing more resources that way yeah i'll i'll get in touch with them this more and then i'll see if they're happy to 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 share and i'll um try and uh, start a connected dm between us that'd be wonderful yeah it's um it's not an easy problem to solve 
Um, but I do think I do think we're making a bit of headway. Um, and Kiwi Kiwi says it's something that's always on his mind. So um, hopefully one of these days he wakes up with an epiphany. <laughs> Are there any is there any other questions uh, or comments from anyone else before we wrap up? Just coming up to an hour. I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. All right, I think I'm gonna. I'll call it and uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, the last gov call of 2021. Uh, the next gov call will be the first Wednesday in 2022, as long as that's not January 1st and we'll all be hungover. Um, it's a Saturday. No, it's a, no it's Saturday. It's a Wednesday. It's Wednesday the 5th. So it'll be Wednesday the 5th of January. And I think um, it might be a, uh, a reflection time. We look back on uh, the last twelve months of of what NFTX has been and and where it's going to be going. Anniversary party. That's it. We'll have to do a poll up or something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you for attending. Uh, this will be available uh, on YouTube uh, in the next couple of days, and we'll post that back up on uh, Discord. Uh, if you have any other contributions or questions or anything, you can always find us on Discord uh, or use the forum for any proposals that you want to put forward. Nice. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks all. Bye. Bye bye. See you guys. Bye. bye now.